It's all set. It's all set okay. for your reading okay. on 339. Yes, yes. Now, when you get done, which is right here, yes. if you want, you could flip the page for my reading. Okay, If sure. you forget, don't worry about it. Because okay. this will be in it. Okay. And then if you were a second reader, oh, yes. which you're not, yes. you have to take this off. Okay. And bring it down to the table at the bottom. Okay. Which is a little clumsy because it's you gotta go down the stairs okay. holding the book. Okay. So you have to be careful. Okay, okay. Thank you.
Good morning and welcome to the Cathedral of the Immaculate Conception. The entrance antiphon is found on the first page of your service leaflet. Please rise and join in singing. In God's name we pray, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
today, my brothers and sisters, is, as you know, October is Respect Life Month, and we have a special Mass today uh, to uh, bring to our consciousness the dignity of every human life and how God loves us all. Uh, we're also very, very pleased to welcome once again our, the Catholic Daughters of America who are celebrating a memorial Mass for their deceased members for whom we're praying today. And in many, many ways, the Catholic Daughters are living witness to the respect for all lives and all of the care that they show for vulnerable people, for all of us, and in their prayers and their wonderful Christian witness. So we're very thankful for all of that. And um, I invite everybody today to think perhaps at this Mass of uh, any person that you may know, any persons that you may know who may be in any way in harm's way. Certainly through this pandemic, the, uh, the difficulties have been not only physical ones, but the emotional and mental stress that this has caused. This is also a mental health week too that we are conscious of so many people who are suffering in many ways in depression and from emotional illness. So we pray for all of us actually, and we pray for ourselves uh, in our own human vulnerabilities, which sometimes lead us to make bad choices, even to sin, sometimes out of discouragement or even despair. God is very forgiving and there's no reason for us to turn away from God because God never turns away from us. So aware of the Lord's mercy, we do call to mind our sins and ask God's forgiveness. Almighty God, have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen.
let us pray. Almighty, ever-living God, who in the abundance of your kindness surpass the mercy and desires of those who entreat you, pour out your mercy upon us to pardon what conscience dreads and to give what not dare to ask to our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of Genesis. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a suitable partner for him. So the Lord God formed out of the ground various wild animals and various birds of the air, and he brought them to the man to see what he would call them. Whatever the man called each of them would be its name. The man gave names to all the cattle, all the birds of the air, and all wild animals but none proved to be the suitable partner for the man. So the Lord God cast a deep sleep on the man, and while he was asleep, he took out one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. The Lord God then built up into a woman the rib that he had taken from the man. When he brought her to the man, the man said, this one, at last, is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called woman, for out of her, man, this one has been taken. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and clings to his wife, and the two of them become one flesh. The word of the Lord. Thank you. 
A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Brothers and sisters, he for a little while was made lower than the angels, that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting that he, for whom and through whom all things exist, in bringing many children to glory, should make the leader to their salvation perfect through suffering. He who consecrates and those who are being consecrated all have one origin. Therefore, he is not ashamed to call them brothers. The word of the Lord. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. The Pharisees approached Jesus and asked him, Is it lawful for a husband to divorce his wife? They were testing him. He said to them in reply, What did Moses command you? They replied, Moses permitted a husband to write a bill of divorce and dismiss her. But Jesus told them, because of the hardness of your hearts, he wrote this commandment. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, no human being must separate. In the house, the disciples again questioned Jesus about this. He said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. 
and people were bringing children to him that he might touch them, but the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he became indignant and said to them, let the children come to me and do not prevent them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Amen, I say to you, whoever does not accept the kingdom of God like a child will not enter it. Then he embraced them and blessed them, placing his hands on them. The Gospel of the Lord. The late Pope John Paul I, the uh, September Pope, you may remember him about 30 years ago, I think, 40 years ago it was, uh, stunned his weekday audience one day when talking about, I think, these scripture passages that we just heard today. He said, you know, marriage is a little like a bird cage. All the birds in the outside are trying to get in, and all the birds in the inside are trying to get out. And um, it, it seems very appropriate, too, because the focus of the gospel is not the focus of the Pharisees. Uh, the first reading and the gospel are focused, indeed, on, uh, on marriage. And it's a good thing that the, the Pharisees raise the subject because it gives Jesus an opportunity to clarify things. And um, you see, the Pharisees are trying to trap Jesus because they are a little obsessive compulsive themselves. Now, I don't mean to disgrace any OCD people. The church could not run without them. It's very important to be conscientious about rules and regulations and laws. They give us direction. They help us to kind of moor ourselves, to orient ourselves. So it's important that we have moral laws. It's important that we have civil laws. They help order society. As you know, the Pharisees were very, very concerned about following the law. And it was not easy because there were about 627 of them that they could count. And uh, it created quite a problem for them. And, but it was also a temptation for them to judge others because they could catch you if you might have obeyed 626 of them, but not that one. You see how vicious circle. And of course, Jesus is going to a much deeper level. And he says, yeah, Moses allowed the couple to divorce, but uh, that was not God's original intent, that he did it for the hardness of their hearts. So he's calling us to a deeper level. What is he doing? He's pointing out something that we're very much uh, aware of from our own society today the tendency to objectify, to thingify, to lie human beings, to make them into objects of convenience for ourselves, rather than to see them in their own right as being sons and daughters of God, created in God's image and likeness. This is what we see in the very early pages of Genesis. We heard the second creation account today, about the creation of man and woman, how there is a complementarity, how they are there 
for each other, to be united with each other. And of course, he, the sacred author uh, might perhaps be hinting at marriage itself, but in some sense, all men are created to be fathers in some way. All men have within themselves some desire for some form of fathering. And when that desire, that basic need is frustrated, it creates a lot of problems. It's creating a lot of problems in our society right now. Men who feel useless because they're unemployed, uh, perhaps because they are uh, not recognized even within their own families for who they are and for what their role is. Perhaps they're confused over their roles. And it drives them to forms of despair, sometimes to drugs and to drink. And much of the violence that we see today in the streets is for men that have no sense of their own purpose and may be rejected by their families. On the other hand, the frustration of women who are looking certainly for men who they can trust and rely on to be able to create a family that they would desire themselves to. There's a mothering instinct in every woman in some way or another, in some way. It may not be manifested in marriage, but in some way a desire to protect, to nurture. Uh, men and women share these traits too, of course, we know. But Genesis is very, very clear on that, that there is a cooperation between men and women that is part of nature itself. It's the way God created it. But it's interesting the reason that is given. And first account of creation to get that male and female, God created them in the image of God. He created them. There's something about the relationship between men and women, whether it is just within ordinary uh, experience, whether it's in marriage itself, which is that very, very special friendship which we'll talk about in a minute. But there's something about that that mirrors something happening inside of God because what is revealed to us, it's only hinted at in the pages of Genesis, is that God is not just an individual. God is a community of persons, equal and yet different, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And uh, the theology, of course, would be too much for us to, to contemplate. Nobody can figure that out. It's a mystery. But God is, is, is internally dynamic and essentially love. The Holy Spirit, I have heard referred to as the love between the Father and the Son, a love between two persons so great that it self-generates another person. And we can see instantly how that is patterned in marriage. That marriage is that unique relationship out of which other human beings come by the will of the parties who are the ministers of the sacrament. And it is sacred because it reflects the image of God in, in many ways. I'm, I'm, I'm afraid that in our society, we've, we've lost a sense of that. We've kind of um, reduced marriage to uh, a kind of a contract between two people for as long as they want, for whatever purposes they may want it for. And uh, it te tends to focus totally on the two persons. And you know, marriage is at its best, just like the church is at its best, when it's not only navel-gazing, when it's not only focused internally on itself, but actually outside. And True happiness in, in any relationship, really, really comes when that relationship understands that there's some, it's caught up in something larger than itself. It's not just a matter of, I only have eyes for you, because that would put so much of a burden on both of the parties, that you must be my savior, I must be your savior. And we can't do that. We're human beings, we're sinners. We need a savior within our lives and Christian marriage, and actually marriage built upon the biblical image, Judeo-Christian, is built upon the foundation of God being in the center of that relationship. And of course, 
this has tremendous consequences if we really dig down deeply into what that means. I mentioned the attitude of the Pharisees tended to reduce marriage to a kind of a thing, an object, and it's very, very similar today. Jesus does something very remarkable. Notice the apostles are fascinated by this, and it is a fascinating thing for us to contemplate. I think when they ask Jesus, you know, tell us more about what you were getting at, I don't think it's because they didn't complete, they didn't understand or they rejected what he was saying, but they realized that there was more to this, and they wanted to know more. And then what they do is they give Jesus an opportunity to show them what he means, because uh, no sooner does he engage in dialogue when they start chasing the children away. It's interesting, isn't it? You know, talking about marriage and they're chasing children away, you know? There's something, there's something that's not appropriate to be charitable when a marriage chases children away, no room for it, you know? And let's face it, children can be messy. Children can be difficult. Children require sacrifice. And the second reading points out to that, that the sacrifice that the incarnate Word of God, that Jesus did, becoming a little less than the angels, to share our condition in all things but sin, how inconvenient that was for Jesus. But love, true love in, in human flesh is inconvenient and it requires sacrifice. Well, anyway, they shoo them away. But there's something even more going on here because perhaps they were somewhat influenced by the attitude towards children at Roman law, which as you may well be aware, a child was neutered, was considered, again, an object, a thing that could be disposed of by the pater familias, who was usually the, uh, the oldest male in any family structure. And he could even abandon, discard, kill his own children. Isn't that horrible? It's so, so brutal, isn't it? How barbarian, how barbaric those Romans were. Well, maybe we shouldn't point the finger that way when the other three fingers point back at ourselves. Doesn't our society treat children legally, unborn children? as less than human? Don't we sometimes regard, or isn't there pressures now to pass legislation? It's called assisted suicide, but legislation to enable even medical professionals that are meant to be purveyors of life, to, to be accompanying people in, in their life, in their health, to be able to assist in the process of killing another human being. And of course, what often happens where these laws are passed, and we understand the emotional arguments and the real arguments of people who might be in terrible pain. But there are different stages of life when all of us can suffer terrible, terrible pain. It just doesn't happen at the end of life. Uh, a 16-year-old that's just lost the love of his or her life sometimes wonders whether life is worth living. If we go back to our, our own experience, there are times when people can be in the throes of depression where there doesn't seem to be any tomorrow that could be better than today. So we can see how these kind of laws can really lead to an awful lot of human tragedy. A person who may decide that their life is not worth living and wants to be out of the way and even worse, those that would put pressure on another human being to end it all because your life is useless. You know, every tyrant throughout the course of history has had some system of putting people in different brackets and based upon those judgments, diminishing the dignity of the person. And we see this famously. We saw Hitler did it who not only the Jewish people, which was the most obvious example, but other members of society that didn't fit in to his version of who was useful and who was not, and how many people were murdered. Stalin was worse. But even today, uh, in the uh, People's Republic of China, the plight of the Uyghurs, who are Muslims living in the northern part of China, in in, in Manchuria, 
who are persecuted. Genocide is going on even as we speak. It's also happening in certain areas of the Middle, Middle East and in Pakistan, where Christians are being persecuted simply because they're Christians. So we see that it's appropriate for us at this Mass and at this time to pray that the dignity of every human life be upheld, not only in our hearts and in our prayers, but in our laws as well, in our social order. These are all really justice issues. The radical dignity and equality of every human being from conception to natural death. This isn't just a Catholic position, my brothers and sisters. This is something that basic biology and science demonstrates. From the moment of conception, you have a unique genetic code. You have a unique subject, if you will. Call it a person, call it a human being. It will never become anything other than a human being. And if there is nothing that interferes with that growth, will grow to the full extent that a human being can grow. This is the science. So there's no way in which we should be cowed by those that say, oh, that's just a Catholic position. You don't want to impose your personal position. This is something that everybody, you know, there are atheists for life. It's a big movement actually going on. If you go down to the March for Life, there are many people that are not of our faith, but recognize the truth, the dignity of every human being. I mentioned the issue is broader than only preborn life, and it certainly is. And there is something to say about how racism in our society, or not just in our society, everywhere. Once again, uh, it is no longer it is no longer possible to maintain that race itself is even a reasonable category, which within to classify human beings. I know that when you check out those, um, those forms, they'll ask you, are you Latino, are you Hispanic, you know, are you Asian, are you, and so forth. And these may be, these are social constructs, but they don't seem to have any basis in actual genetic history. Did you know that? That in fact, what, Saint, what the author of Hebrews says in today's gospel, that we all come from one origin, I don't think it was meant to be a doctrinal statement on, the, uh, on all human beings, but you know, our, by our own faith, we believe that we're children of, of Adam and Eve. And sometimes there, there have been many scholars that have said, well, these are just prototypes. There were actually more than one Adam and Eve. But uh, consulting with uh, people that have been following the research on the common origin of humanity, it's becoming increasingly clear that in fact, there was a common parent, which means that all races come from a common parent, whoever that may have been. May not have been named Adam and Eve, but that, that is what the science is pointing toward. Now you know, there is never settled science. Science must always be open to change uh, as it becomes more aware of facts that it discovers in its research. But uh, these are all things for us to contemplate that uh, we can make certainly arguments in favor of the defense of human life at all stages, not only from the position of our faith, which is very clear, but from the position of science itself. They are not at odds with one another. So as a foundation for our law, for our social order, we can rely on more than just what we believe. We can rely on what in fact is, what the truth is about who we are. These are things for us to contemplate today, but I think in closing, what I would like to focus on is how we personally, in our own lives, uh, are, are dealing with some of the discrepancies that we run into. And I'll use a silly example maybe, but those who mask and those who don't mask. You know, it's becoming almost a, a comedy in some ways whereby we judge people on the basis of the medical decisions that they make to vaccinate or not to vaccinate. And we guilt people that don't follow what we think is right. 
I make no mistake about it. There is no particular Catholic position other than that we need to take care of our own health and we should do everything to take care of one another's health. So we need to be aware of it. That is the fundamental principle. But as far as what our religion will tell us, you know, some of you have heard about the so-called religious exemption. I've been asked by people, could I write an exemption for somebody not to take the vaccination? I cannot get base it upon our religion. Our faith does not tell us you cannot. Our faith does not tell us you must. This is something that we have to wrestle with in our own conscience based upon the best that we can learn from what is known and what is not known about what a vaccine is or is not. And uh, I'm not gonna take a position on that because it's still unfolding. There are consequences and we have to deal with them and wrestle with them. My point is only to say that we're not here to judge others because of the decisions that they make. Uh, and to be, keep in mind that ultimately uh, charity is the ultimate law by which we operate. So if we walk into an environment where a sign says, please put a mask on, fine. Uh, it's a charitable thing to do. If you're adamant about it, say I'm not gonna do it, but consider that there are consequences as well too. My point is that we have to refrain if we're going to be good Christian people from making judgments on other people as to why they do the things they do that are not objectively right or wrong morally. It's not the same thing as saying, I'm going to take my own position on killing somebody. Murder is murder, no matter who does it. You know, so um, uh, I hope I'm being clear on this too. These are difficult questions we wrestle with. But let's take other examples as well, too. How at times, because of our personal experience, we can make judgments of people because of where they come from, whatever country or whatever language they speak, or the way they speak their language. Some people seem to speak more loudly than others, and sometimes we generalize and say, oh, look at those loud, you fill in the blanks, you know. Uh, we want to ask ourselves personally, are we allowing a kind of collectivist view? When we start thinking of people in terms of, of collectives, in terms of masses, in terms of groups, we can run the risk of denying the personhood of the individual. I mean, we've seen that happen. We know that there are some clergy that have abused children but not all priests are pedophiles. Now, I know you know that, but, uh, but it's not only priests. There are other professions that have been subject to the same kind of thing as well, too. <laughs> Famously lawyers. There are good lawyers, wonderfully good lawyers. I love lawyers. They keep me out of trouble. I like them, you know. So we have uh, using names to describe people with a broad stroke. And we could do that with races, we could do that with certain categories of people, immigrants, for example, who actually are here in different stages. You know, some may be documented, some may not. But one sweep of the pen, putting all people in one class, particularly if the persons have different customs than we do. So I know most of us are very conscientious about this, so I hope nothing that I say I do not mean to offend, I do not mean to judge myself, but all of us need to call ourselves to conscience in the way we conduct ourselves on a, on a regular basis. Uh, sometimes sweeping statements are made about all men or all women. Nobody speaks for all men, nobody speaks for all women. Uh, we are human beings, each and every one of us made in the image and likeness of God. And it really points right back to excellent psychology. If we think of ourselves only in terms of what group we're a part of, which is often a social group or sometimes a political advocacy group, we can dehumanize ourselves. Every human being is unique in the eyes of God. Human being somehow or other is made for relationship. And I go right back to where we start. 
Male and female, he created them. Yeah, I know there's variations on the scope and all that stuff, but those are the polarities. They've always been, they always will be. Uh, there are people that have personal identity issues, and we need to be uh, merciful and understanding about that. But the reality is that we are all made in the image, and we are made in some way for God and for each other. No man is an island, I think, is the cliched way to say it, that we live in community. During this, um, this pandemic, let's call it, uh, there's been a tremendous amount of suffering because of the isolation. And in some ways, the emotional and, uh, and the physical separation has been as painful and destructive as the actual disease itself. So it's no wonder that we're conscious of mental health, which is something that we're praying for, those that are experiencing uh, mental health issues. Many, many people, more than in previous years, because of the effects of this pandemic, are suffering from depression and, and alienation, and sometimes tensions within families themselves. So we want to pray for God's help. Help us, number one, to realize we are loved by God beyond our imagination, each and every one of us. And secondly, that we who know that we are loved by God and created in God's image and likeness show that same love and respect. You don't have to like everybody, but the same respect for every human being, regardless of their difference, regardless of their status, regardless of their age or their sex or anything else about them or their race, that we recognize that Jesus died for every human being without exception and wants everyone to be saved. I often say, wouldn't it be ironic if God in his infinite sense of mercy, if we happen to make it to the heavenly banquet table, would sit us next to the person who we could least stand in this life for all eternity? Prepare for it. There may be a lot of people up there that we didn't have anything to do with in this life. So no time like the present for us to make our amends, to ask forgiveness uh, from one another, to let go of the judgments, and to recognize that in each and every one of us, there is an image of God written in our souls that when the tarnish is taken off, glows. We stand now to profess our faith. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and invisible. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father, through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. And by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. God, our creator, has given us the breath of life in our mother's womb and made us stewards of his creation. We now present our petitions with the confident hope that we may remain faithful to this sacred trust. In peace, let us pray. 
to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. For the church, may we always desire a deeper friendship with God and act to deepen our friendship through prayer and good works. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all those advocating for the dignity of life through special diocesan Respect Life Ministry, and for all people of goodwill, may we always give clear witness to the dignity of life from conception, be prepared to assist, especially those who are vulnerable. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all people of goodwill throughout the world, may they grow in understanding of their human dignity and that of all persons as sons and daughters of God, created in his image and likeness. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the leaders of our nation, state, and local communities, and for all world leaders, may they always cooperate for the common good and promote legislation that respects life at all stages. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all mothers and fathers who face complicated pregnancies, may God bestow upon them grace in abundance to be loving parents to their unborn children with all of the support that they need. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all those who are forced from their homeland due to fear, violence, oppression, and war, may they find refuge, peace, safety, and compassion for themselves and their children. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all those who are unemployed or underemployed, May they find gainful and rewarding work that befits their human dignity. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all who are ill or infirm, may they remain steadfast through their suffering, comforted by the presence of family and friends. May all caregivers and medical professionals bring comfort to those in their care. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For Angeles Pedraves on their 75th birthday. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear For all who have died, especially Karen Scholl, Catherine Chichester, and all members of the Catholic Daughters of the Americas. For our deceased relatives, parishioners, benefactors, and friends. For Father Michael Dwyer on the anniversary of his death. May all who sleep in Christ enjoy the peace and rest of God's presence. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Accept our humble petitions, O Lord of the living, and unite us to the perfect offering of your Son, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen.
Pray, my sisters and brothers, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. Accept, O Lord, we pray, the sacrifices instituted by your commands, and through the sacred mysteries which we celebrate with dutiful service, graciously complete the sanctifying work by which you are pleased to redeem us through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks. Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, for we know it belongs to your boundless glory that you came to the aid of mortal beings with your divinity and even fashioned for us a remedy out of mortality itself cause of our downfall might become the means of our salvation through Christ our Lord. Through him the host of angels adores your majesty and rejoices in your presence forever. May our voices, we pray, join with theirs in one chorus of exultant praise as we acclaim. You are indeed holy, O Lord, and all you have created rightly gives you praise. For through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and working of the Holy Spirit, you give life to all things and make them holy. And you never cease to gather a people to yourself, so that from the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. Therefore, O Lord, we humbly implore you by the same Spirit, Graciously make holy these gifts we have brought to you for consecration, that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command mysteries. For on the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread and gave it to his disciples saying, take this all of you and eat of it, for this is my body which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice and once more giving thanks, he said the blessing and gave the chalice to his disciples saying, 
Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many heaviness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. Therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the saving passion of your Son, his wondrous resurrection and ascension, and as we look forward to his second coming, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray, upon the oblation of your church, and recognizing the sacrificial victim by whose death you willed to reconcile us to yourself, grant that we who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son and filled with his Holy Spirit, they become one body, one spirit in Christ. May he make us an eternal offering to you, so that we may obtain an inheritance with your elect, especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with your blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, and with all the saints on whose constant intercession in your presence we rely for unfailing help. May this sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O Lord, advance the peace of the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth with your servant, Francis our Pope, and Edward our Bishop, the order of bishops, all the clergy, and the entire people you have gained for your own. Listen graciously to the prayers of this family whom you have summoned before you. In your compassion, O merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world. To our departed brothers and sisters, and to all who were pleasing to you at their passing from this life, give kind admittance to your kingdom. There we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory through Christ our Lord, through whom you bestow on the world all that is good. Through him and with him and in him, O God, almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. At the Savior's command and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, O Lord, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. Let us offer each other the sign of peace. peace and Have mercy on us. 
take away the sins of the world. Grant us peace. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed.
Let us pray. Grant us, almighty God, that we may be refreshed and nourished by the sacrament which we have received, so as to be transformed into what we consume through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated a moment. We are thrilled that we could come together as the Catholic Daughters of New York State to remember our deceased members of the Albany Diocese in this way. Because of the pandemic, the last time we were able to do this was back in 2019 at our memorial masses. And it's such a delight for me to be here today and to have the honor of presenting our seminary donation to you, Bishop Schaffenberger. On behalf of the 4,500 Catholic Daughters in New York State, we would like to present you with a check for $1,500 to be used towards the education of seminarians in the Albany Diocese. These monies, they represent the donations of all of the members of Catholic Daughters in New York State, and they were made in honor of Marie C. Curry, who passed away at a national convention. We continue to honor her with this tradition, and we recognize the need for more vocations to the priesthood, to all religious life, and we pray that the Lord will send workers to his vineyard. Thank you, Bishop Schaffenberger, for allowing us to attend this Mass that you have celebrated for us. And thank you for your, also for your continued support of the Catholic Daughters, especially here in the Albany Diocese. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.
The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Bow down for the blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Amen. Amen. May he let his face shine upon you and show you his mercy. Amen. Amen. May he turn his countenance towards you and give you his peace. Amen. And may the blessing of Almighty God and the Holy Spirit come upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Amen. Go forth. The Mass is ended. Thanks be to God.